my name is Allison Hunt. Today's date is March 23rd, 2018, and I am interviewing Fez Muhammad Fez on the Ball State campus as part of the Virginia B. Ball Center seminar, Muslims in Muncie. Fez, thank you for sharing your story with us today. You're welcome, man. So I'd like to start with where and when were you born? With where and when were you born? <laughs> I was born in my one room that my father, my mother, and have my cows living there. We had one house, and then the gate was, we enter, the cows went that way, we tied them there, and my father, mother, and my sister were having this, row, this part of the house, we, and it's all mud. And there was no hospital, no doctor, nothing. But I was born with the grace of God. And you were born in Afghanistan? Correct? Afghanistan, Jalalabad. Uh, what year was that? I exactly cannot tell you that, but nobody have that. Like in America, <clears throat> you have to have your date of birth and your social security. We did not have those because most of us did not read or write. So uh, I, when I came to America, they asked me, how old are you, and like the same question. And I said, I do not know, but let me ask my father. So I went to my father's uh, the, the next day. I said, Dad, do you remember when I was born, which month? Because we have four distinct seasons, not like here, mixed up. And he said that, uh, I don't know what Jim, what Jim is my son. I don't know son, but I think when we were born, King Amallah Khan came to power. There's the king, this the last king just gone now. Before that was his father, and before that, three kings up. That was the king that I was born at that day. So then I had to go see the the book of the history of, of, of Afghanistan when King Amallah Khan came to power. So that made my, roughly, my year, or two, three years, and one year, but anyway, that, that, that they determined that that was my day, my year. Then there was a Dr. Sowers. He said, now how do we do about your day and, and month? I said, you know something? In America, the 21st of, of, of uh, uh, March is springtime. So let's take the first 21st your day and the month of March, so you're born spring, so that's how it becomes. Can you tell me a little bit about your parents? My parents? Mm -hmm. When I came, uh, uh, my f father, my mother passed away when I was four or five, something in that area. <coughs> But uh, before me, she had three daughters, four daughters. Two of them died and two of them were living. One is the first daughter, and I was the last of all of them. And so then you didn't have, in Afghanistan, you cannot go date, there's no dating. And so if you want to get married, then you find out uh, through some friends, so and so family has a daughter there or a son there, so you want to get married with. And then they go communicate with them that would you like to marry so and so or something like that. So somebody came and told my dad that there's a 
a lady there that uh, maybe would be interested in you. So he got married with him, with her, I mean. So me and my sister and my father and his new wife, we lived together for a while until his first, second wife had two other children. They are here now, their two, uh, two sons. And uh, so this is how I was born. And I was born uh, like when you warm up the house, you have a little fireplace in there. You make fire and you sit down and cook and have uh, tea, make. And I was born around that fire here. Uh, what was it like growing up in Jalalabad during the 1940s and 50s? Uh, could you tell me something? Um, say, say that again. Okay. What was it like uh, growing up in Jalalabad during the 1940s and 50s? The, the country was poor, poor. Uh, my father never had a, a good job. He went in there and cut reeds for making a fire to make the bricks for the building baked for the government. So she may, he made nine Afghanis, which is about 75 cents at that time, for 12 hours of, of uh, uh, June, July, this time. And sometimes he didn't get paid. We didn't have food. But then, then in Afghanistan, your your relatives around always come and ask you, "Do you have something to eat today?" And if they share with you, we did the same thing. So it was a very very difficult. Now, I wouldn't say that difficult if I didn't come to America, right? But then there it was difficult. Uh, sometimes I walked 10 miles to my school from the first grade to the sixth grade. And on the road, there was these uh, farmers, they have these little radishes, you know, and they pick up and I become so hungry, I didn't have anything else. So I went in there, if any one of them was still there, I pick it out and wash and eat. Or I eat mulberry, things like that. And, and also with bare feet, bare head. And <clears throat> people, there was a, a man who was rich a little bit in our village. And there was a shop. Sometimes I went in there, he was eating something like watermelon or something like that. And I honestly, I remember my mouth become watering, how it, how, how it tastes that he eats that. So that, that much poverty exists in me. And that's, uh, and everywhere I went there, I had to walk. Bare feet, or somebody put me in the back of his bicycle. Now, in one day, I think it was in the third grade, I, and I, when, I think I told you or not, but I, there was an American standing in front of my my uh, uh, post office because I passed through the town. He was a tall guy, he was an American. And we learned English, not English itself, but about the English, like grammar. Uh, he is a, a girl, he is subject, and is his verb, object is the, the word girl. 
and everybody you, you couldn't talk to anybody. Everybody comes to see like this because they're shorter, and this American style. So I told myself, "What's wrong with me? Why don't I learn to speak it?" And so I began to talk to myself. <laughs> Every everything I learned in school, we had seventeen subjects. English was one of them. And when I get the, uh, the word, then I had to put it into a sentence and talk to, to myself, 10 miles. I had this problem of speaking it. it this was a fear that if I talk and maybe I mispronounce or something, somebody will laugh. And laughing is very bad in there. If you laugh somebody, they would fight with you. And I did not want to do that. So, but I, by talking to myself on the road, that courage was kind of died down. I talk, I don't care. So, I come out one time, I think I was in the seventh grade or eighth grade, uh, from the school and coming home. Now there is a highway goes connects Kabul to Peshawar, Pakistan. It passed by the school that way. So this other American standing there, whereas these soldiers handicapped, they were uh, as a labor because we didn't have the money to hire labor. But as the soldier, they had to go either fight or go do these kind of thing. So he was, the, he was there and he had an interpreter, but he was not there. So I, the courage of talking to myself, I asked him, hi, how are you? He said, fine, how are you doing? I said, fine, I, what grade are you in? Well, I, I cannot I remember all of it, but Sometimes some things I did not understand it because the pronunciation, the T, rough T, my English based on the Indian English, which is English English, like water, bottom, things like that. And, and this Americans water, bottom, things like that. I don't know what, what he was saying. But anyway, I told him, I said, I want to work with you when I come out from school free. So the, the interpreter came in there and he said, okay, when you come out of school, we are on this road and come in there, work with us. And I, I then want to make sure that I will be closer to the somebody to speak English. And his name was, uh, Mr. Gillespie, David Gillespie, very nice man. He, <coughs> he came in there, if he didn't have his interpreter there, and came and wait for him in the school. <laughs> that three, it's three, uh, three o'clock, he would put him into his pickup and take him way back to the border of Pakistan where the paving started, so I interpreted that. So that's the way I learn English. And I become, and one of those, those are, uh, I, 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 because this is my favorite and I have to tell you that. He, there was an asphalt pit that he was kind of trying to put those pipes so the asphalt would boil and then they take him, put him in the road. It's way back in the, down the ground. And I'm standing here where his pickup, pickup is. And it's about 11 o'clock June days and things like that. And there there's no trees, it's all mountains. He said, Fez, going to my truck, in the bottom of my truck there's a water uh, the, the, uh, my water jug in the bottom of my 
truck he had put it underneath because that's so it would not make it warm, the sun. Now I don't know what water is. I don't know what bottom is. So I run around back and forth. So I pretend that I, I'm doing it, but I didn't. I felt bad. And after a while, he got thirsty again <laughs> because he couldn't take it anymore. He said, Fess, go bring my water jacket at the bottom of my truck. I still didn't know, and I got really worried. So finally, he, he couldn't take it anymore. He got up, he said, come here. He said, this is the bottom of my car. This is <laughs> the water jug. Then I know that is water. That I, I, I studied water, not water, <laughs> or bottom, things like that. So that's how I learned English. But then I uh, later on become better talker. Then there was a group of Americans came in to teach English in our courses, our high schools. And they are taught, they asked me to go and teach them my language to them so that they can they can communicate. And uh, I found out that he had the same problem too. Yeah. Uh, he, but it is it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Then, when I became in the tenth grade, so we paved the road to Kabul, and Mr. Gillespie said, "You have to go to America." I said, "I love to, but there's no way that I will go." So who is your boss? Said Mr. Sauer, Dr. Sauer from Columbia University. So he took me to Dr. Sauer. He said, Dr. Sauer, my name is Mr. Gillespie and I'm working on this road and I want fast to go to America, but put him into the English department. And he says, we cannot do it now because he has to go to first grade freshman. Then we can put him. And by the way, when I was finished the first grade, my name was the first one to be named in his department. Now, up to now, I haven't written in any plane how it's dries and things like that. I never saw any other countries beyond my comprehension. So, when I became a senior, <clears throat> I there was a we in our classes in Afghanistan. Uh, we numbered the students based on their ability and intelligence. Our first uh, number one student was a lady who was born and raised in England. So the English department, he was she was our the first one. The second one is from my village. Neither he nor I would had. I had a lot more contact with Americans or English speaker than he did, but he beat me one fourth of his grade. So he become number two, and I become number three. So he, when we graduated, he went to America. He came to Columbia University. So Dr. Arson said, "Okay, you go to Canada and become." Uh, the chairman of the English departments in 11 high schools. And if you did a good job, I'll send you. That's what I ended up here. All right, so when did you graduate from Kabul University? Uh, I came in here August the 18th, 1967. And in June of that day, of that year, I graduated. I won't, sorry, sorry. Because I was already graduated two years that Dr. Hudson said, okay, you go. Because that, that ambassador came, saw my schooling, and, and then he said, send him to school, to, to America. So that's, it. then they cleared me up for coming in here 
uh, it started from June because they give you, you have to go through a whole lot of uh, examinations and physical. Then they send you here. So I arrived here 18th of August, 1967, and I finished 1969. Then I go back and there for two years. I, I met my wife here. She was my classmate. And uh, so she went with me. Her uh, job was also, I mean, field was uh, English literature. So she was teaching at the Kabul University the English, not the English, but the uh, agriculture department. And I was teaching English in the English department. Um, going back a little bit, how did you first begin to learn about the Quran as a child? Say that. Uh, how did you first begin to learn about the Quran oh. as a child? Uh, first of all, as a Muslim, no child would grow up without reading the Quran. Because Quran is not our language. The, lang the language is Arabic. But uh, you, when I was little, my father, I didn't want to go to the mosque, and he was about to beat me to get up and go learn, read the Quran. So you go in there, learn uh, one sentence, two sentences. But the good part in the Quran is that all those words that completed the message of God, they are over and over and over. So the language may be a lot more bigger than that, but the language of Quran is limited to the message. And so once you learn the middle of, up to the middle of the Quran, then you can read it yourself. I, and the reason I, I, it was easier for me because I speak Persian and I speak Pashto. These two word sentences, I mean, language is there. And they both is written like Arabic. So I didn't have any problem. Uh, I didn't have problem, but only my father was pushing me a lot. I ran away. But then, but I, I, I just, now I finish Holy Quran every two weeks. I'm, I'm reading. Um, how did Islam shape your family's uh, relationship and your practices? In Islam, we just, when, before you picked me up, that, that man gave us a, a speech. And what, that was all about that. In Islam, I have found it also to myself, reading there, there's a Arabic and there is a English. Uh, some words of the English, I do not understand, it's old English. Uh, in Islam, there is no hostility. If you are a hostile Islam Muslim, you are not a good Muslim. Secondly, you will be punished very severely because in the very first sentence of this whole book of Quran is Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen means praise be to Allah who is the Lord of humanity. But it doesn't say the Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Muslimin. It doesn't say that. That means praise be to Allah who is the God of Muslims. The God created us how? And we can see in ourselves. I mean, you are in America, I'm from the other end of the world. We're human. We eat food, we can see, use eyeglasses, I got me today, one <laughs> things like that. So there's got to be one God. If there are two gods, three gods, then there will be two world, and there will be hostility. And this God is the very first sentence of Quran. No hostility. You don't ask people to become Muslim. If they ask you, answer it. And then if people misguided themselves, then those messengers came. And the messengers 
It's not only Jesus busy upon him. There is a hundred of them, a hundred thousand of them. Ever since the Adam was uh, became uh, made up, God made him from pottery clay and gave him the, the, the soul. Okay, now, that were the, the children of, of Adam and Eve. So there would be one God, one religion, but then the, as human expanded with ideas and monies and 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 uh, uh, what do you call it? Not social, no. Uh, politics and things like that. So they added up in order to get themselves in front of, of groups of people. And then that we accepted. Now, who said to the Christianity that Jesus was the Son of God? The Greek. The Greek called the Romans at the time and said, say that Jesus is the Son of God. And they said, this is not in the Bible. He said, don't say it, don't, because they were the head of, apparently the head of power in there. No, just say it, this is the Son of God. Now, Jesus never had said in the Bible, and the Bible that is that he was carrying is like Quran, and he will bring it back to him when he come back. Question? Um, so I'd like to hear a little bit more about your time in Kandahar, um, being the head of the English department for 11 high schools, you said? Yeah. Uh, could you tell me a little more about that? Yeah, first of all, Kandahar is a very, very special group of humanity there. They are Pashto speakers. And most of them, they don't get married. And homosexuality, they don't talk about it, but it's there. And very rough people. There, there's all kinds of these uh, uh, marijuana and hashish, all kinds of, they, they, they're always like that. But they are rough people. If you talk to them, they don't argue. They cut the, their throat or something. And I, I've seen there. So these people do nothing, but always like that. Uh, you remember, no, you don't, probably history of Afghanistan. Ahmad Shah Baba was the, one of the king came from there. He conquered India at that time, 12 times, and he never, had mercy. Either do it, him, and you're not there. And I, I saw a lot of those people there. So I come from Jalalabad, which is really normal human, and I had a hard time talking to most of them. Wouldn't listen. One time, this is, happened to me. I was sitting there somewhere eating uh, lunch. This restaurant right in the heart of town. And this guy was sitting in there, do nothing, and he has snuff. Okay, and he spit it and again, again. I ate my food and I said, sir, you have any problem? He said, yes. He had a boyfriend who ran away from him. He said, I'm not eating until I get him. Th this is the kind of thinking exists there. But it's a very difficult place to live. Either you be like them or you be standing like a sore thumb and 
and somebody is going to come after you. Uh, our Peace Corps volunteers have a hard time, but we always told him to always be together. So this is the Kandahar. And in the school, they, those are kids, they were kind of taught to discipline, to pay attention to school. And English was kind of not acceptable, especially when the Russians came to Afghanistan or was coming to Afghanistan, they tried to spread their influence in there. Most of the time, I received a call from one of those English teachers that I, do, I don't have any students to teach English. So I went in there, they are gone because we don't learn English because this is Americans. We learn Russians because the communism was, if you remember, it was spreading out, but it's all a bunch of lies. So, <clears throat> This is how, how we went through, through this. Other than that, Kandahar is a very, very rich country. 52 kinds of grapes grow there. And God knows who put them in there. Uh, the, everywhere you go, marijuanas all over, like jungles, you put through them. And every one of them, now lately they started drinking wine, which was being made in Kabul by Italians. So they went and there's somebody bringing in a thing. So this is the kind of people. Um, you mentioned that when you were there, uh, the American ambassador was the one who suggested that you go to America. Could you tell me a little bit about your experience with him? With him, no, I didn't know him. Okay. He came in, he came in from Kabul. Okay, first of all, Dr. Herman Hudson was Afro-American. He had beyond doctor degree from from uh, uh, Chicago. I mean, uh, Michigan, and he was blind, and he was doing so good that a lot of the, the the English team from Columbia University was suspecting that's not true. He's making it up or something like that. So that was that the American Indian American ambassador had had took taken this without telling anybody where he's going to find out. So it was a test for him and a test for the rest of the departments that teach English as a foreign language. Because there was three million or billion dollars that America gave to expand English teaching there. But the, we want to, improve English so that the Russians will not come to Afghanistan. So that's the objective. Uh, do you remember the name of the ambassador? The first name is Steve. Steve. And I could not remember the last name. So moving on, what was it like when you first came to Muncie in 1967? I come to Muncie? Mm -hmm. Well, there's got to be my liking about corns and field, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, mountains. When I accepted to go to Muncie, because I told him that as I like to go somewhere, there's mountain, corn fields and there's mountains, and there's no mountains. He said, you go to Muncie, and he couldn't find in the globe. He said, somewhere here. So, the, we came to Washington in the 17 hours plane ride. And then from Washington, the orientation, cultural orientation, we followed that one week. Then they put us on these buses. 
So whoever goes where? When I was going to go to Mansi. So they put me into this bus, uh, Greyhound. And this other guy is with me too. Uh, he's one of my classmates. He was fifth grade, uh, fifth student. So we came in somewhere in Ohio or maybe somewhere in those areas. We had to change bus. So about 45 minutes or so, we have to wait there. And I found out outside, there's these corns that I came to see him. <laughs> I went in there and just sat down and smell them for a while before my bus started coming, bringing me here. So I have some of those, those uh, uh, pictures I had taken, still I have them. What was so attractive to you about cornfields? Cornfield, there's a smell of tussling. Maybe you, you, you never noticed this, but this happened to be my, 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 I don't know, but uh, the, the, when the tussling, there is a smell in there. And uh, to me, first of all, I didn't have it. We didn't have any field, anything like that. So it's the first time I'm becoming a custom with the cornfield. But I could see other people had a little sh area like this and I passed by it. But that smell, when I hide myself from my father, study there, and while I was studying, that smell was coming to my mind. And that's become a history to my mind. Um, when you first came to Ball State, uh, how did you identify? Did you identify as an Afghani, as a Muslim? Nobody knows Afghanis. Uh, Muslim, I was not that much either. Uh, first of all, uh, if we ourselves didn't want to say Afghanis because a lot of people didn't know what Afghanistan was. but. Uh, Finally, the, uh, uh, everything happens in Afghanistan, kind of known to humanity. Then we, I cook uh, f food from Afghanistan, and I talk about the culture of Afghanistan in this international student house. <coughs> <coughs> Other than that, I, I felt like everybody else was going to us, it was very new. Uh, everything that you come in, like the way you talk to me like that, I'll be so surprised. Because in, in Afghanistan, for example, you cannot find a woman to talk to you like this. And to me, it is new. And Many other mistakes I made, I cannot remember a lot of it. But uh, I always like to like Americans because it began from the third grade. Remember that, how I started English. And the one time we have a dance, this dance is national dance. So it, I cook food in the international house and I, me and these two other, other guy with me. And then there I, found, I found another Afghan, uh, one of the minority of the Afghans called Azara, was in Anderson, they told me that. I brought him and we dance Afghan national dance. So things like that. And finally becomes normal. Um, where did you live when you first came to Ball State? Where what? Where did you live when you first came here? The first week I was supposed to, there was a home hospitalities. Now my home hospital, hospital, hospital person was Dr. Morris Emhoff. He used to be my English teacher in Afghanistan. 
But when, when I came here, I come in here, is uh, uh, had a house in there. Uh, the first week I had to stay with him because he knew me and I know him. And he told me what the do's and the don'ts and things like that. But for the first two days, when he went to work, I knew nobody. So in a study, you see the river in there? And, and then <coughs> he used to be palace. And there was not there, I don't think. And that railroad track go over the river and then goes toward the cemetery. That was a place where I used to sit down and watch the river go. And to me, very new was that the railroad track. I sit in there watching as long as I could take it and then I went on. And so that was my first two days. Then they keep me kind of putting me to more activities in, in the English, I mean, in the Department of, of International here. You said earlier that you were a social chairman at the International House. How did you come to this position? Social chairman? Mm -hmm. The International House? They voted for me. Uh, I was not really a kind of person. I was really had an open personality. If I like something, how our our very much boundary of the culture in Afghanistan is our religion. But then <clears throat> also there is some social. When I came in here, uh, these parties, dancing, cooking food in the National House, and talk and joke that you dare not do it in Afghanistan here. So it, it took me out of my way. But so it continued only one, one year. Then, and I was not the only one. All the international people, especially from the Middle East, these are all Muslims. And they were doing the same thing. So then one Iranian guy came to me and he said, there's a mosque in here. Then I went back, bowed to the mosque, and I didn't do all kind of those things I used to do. So was that your first experience meeting other Muslims here through the International House? Say that again. Was the International House your first experience meeting Muslims at Ball State? No. In fact, Muslims is, 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 uh, it has nothing to do with politics. Unfortunately, all of these Muslims are doing this, Muslims are doing that. That is, these politicians do that, say that. In Islam says, in the Quran, respect people. If somebody slap you, you do the same only once, one slapping. Not more than that. If somebody kill you, then kill him. There's no sin for you in thereafter. That's the Quran. All right. <clears throat> Muslims were based much more on a piece of life because God says, I am the Lord of humanity. So if you do any one of those people without sin or anything like that, you will be directly be thrown into the hell and you will be there forever. It's in the Quran. And so therefore, no, believe me, Muslims could make beautiful politicians based on their faith. But when Americans start killing a lot of people there, simply because the politics took them that way, not because they like to, 
but the politics took them there and people start dislike Americans. That's why they went to Russia. Um, so how did you first meet other Muslims at Ball State? Uh, see other Muslim one? Uh, when you first came to Ball State, how did you first meet Muslims? You go to international, you see Muslims and non-Muslim, as long as you're in international house. Well, first of all, I don't think that Muslims are that <laughs> much friends to each other either. But <clears throat> I've, I respect them. I say hi to them. But majority of my, some of my I mean, friends were from India, Sikh. Hindus, uh, in fact, my teachers, mostly from India, was Sikh and Hindus. So I have no, uh, this barrier that I'm Muslim and he's not. Look at my wife. She is Methodist ever since I married her. And we're married now. 49 years. She does her job and I do my job. Our, our communication was there are problems personally, there's prob problems between us. When there's a problem between us, we can communicate. If it's personally, you do it yourself and I do it myself. There's a flaw fallacy of my life. And I have no, I'll be honest with you, I have no any kind of things against her because she has, she's a Christian. I've been to her church, talked to a lot of people there. And I will never divorce and get married from my country or any other places. I have 10 grandchildren, one son and two daughters. My two daughters are married to the non-Muslims and my son is also married to the non-Muslims. So everybody sleeps in their own graves. But why should I, this short time that God has given us to enjoy each other, whoever you are, bring it through some kind of thing because you, you look colorful, different color. Or, or you're Hindu or Muslims or whatever. So um, the first mosque that you went to in Muncie, that was the one in the village at Ball State. Yeah, yeah. yeah a small, a small uh, uh, room. We were about six of us or something. And one of them was a, uh, came from America. You remember that the, uh, they used to call them black Muslims. Okay, now Amir was his name, very nice Muslim. He he came from there. When I came, there two of them. I saw Abdullah. They they gave themselves that uh, Muslim names. One was Abdullah and one was Amir. They both are gone now. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm the oldest one of all of them. Could you describe for me a little bit the house on Calvert Street, that the mosque, the mosque on Calvert Street? Uh, where was it? Uh, on Calvert Street, the one in the village. You want to come someday? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make, uh, see that when today you put me up in there, there was a lady standing in there and she wants to go to to the mosque, and I said, come on. So the, you, you cannot stand and pray, but sit on those chairs and watch us. Uh, and what was the question now? Um, did you, could you describe the house, the mosque uh, in the village? Okay, now there's five times prayers in a day we pray. Uh, in the morning, early, around 5, 5.30, and then 
two o'clock in the afternoon, then five o'clock, then seven o'clock, then nine o'clock, five up. You, there are, they call them ruka. Uh, so you stand up in front of your God and you pretend that. And you cannot think about anything else, nothing. And God watching you while you pray. And you cannot talk to anybody else. And then you finish your prayer, then you can talk to anybody. Like this, my wife, uh, this morning, I was praying, and she was talking to me. So I didn't talk after I finished. I said, I married with you about 50 years. How come you do not know that I cannot talk when I'm praying? I'm sorry. But you, you talk to nobody except to only to your God, because in this five times prayer, you do not feel like I am the one, nobody else is there. But you find out why we are here. We speak, we drive cars, look at these cameras and all of those. So all of these are God has given us in our brain. And so we have to pray and thank him for all of that. And by doing so, you'll have an easy way forever in the year after. Because this life is shorter here in the world. Um, how often did you attend the mosque when you were a student here? Uh, most, like you guys who go to Sundays, uh, we go on Fridays. In there, but you in 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 Islam, you pray any place that you, you do not have any more time to go to make the mosque. So it doesn't have to be exactly mosque. All you just get a, a clear uh, sheet because the ground is not clean. You spread it in there and pray and finish your prayer and go. So you. You pray anywhere when the time comes, whether you're closer to the mosque or you're not closer to the mosque, it doesn't matter. And, but you do pray though, because the very fact is that everything today we get, I mean, poverty, I've been through it. You want to tell me one thing about the first time I, Somebody gave me his, his bicycle to ride. All right. This one guy was very nice, and they were farmers, but he had a used bicycle. And he said, I asked him, I said, could you teach me how to ride the bicycle? He put me in there on this highway that I was talking about that paved the road out of my school, and went through. I mean, he, he, I, he, he pushed me, then let me go. So I didn't fall, but I would go, there's a group of people <laughs> waiting in there talking, I think they mostly preachers, and I went right into them because I couldn't control it. So this is how I learned to drive. Then one, di one day he lent me his bicycle to go to my village. So what I did was, I took a, <clears throat> to show off, took a, a, a coat, borrowed from somebody, didn't have them. And I get a couple of those narcissus that you call them, there's another name for it, you guys. Narcissus, that in the spring comes in it. And they're all, all over. So four or five of them put in here and ride on the bicycle and, and, and drove into the, through the village. People say, hey, look, he's riding bicycle. He's riding bicycle. So that much is of pride for me at that time.
So when I, every place that I went knew, <clears throat> the very first time when they put me into the plane to go to Iran to study English there for 45 days. And I mean, though that, I didn't see it one night how this is going to be, sitting in there, can you walk, it would fall down or whatever. So all of this to me is, it was way behind my comprehension. Okay, so when you first came to Ball State, did you have to improvise your religious practice at all? No. no. The, in fact, I, to my surprise, at that time, I, there was no religion, uh, Islamic religion, anything, because, in fact, the history of Islam is that when the Quran came to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he carried on up to Africa. Quran never came here because the forefathers came in here, so there was river and things like that. Nobody had it, knowledge to come in here and give the Quran to, for people to read. Now, Quran is here. So therefore, a lot of people did not know they did probably know, but they didn't know much about Islam. Islam is a peaceful religion, has nothing to do with the non-Muslims, and never they would ever uh, playing hostility simply because he or she is not Muslim. Because, I mean, you are Muslim or non-Muslim, you are the master of your own mind. And what is comes, it comes from because you, you, th you think it that way. But these Middle East areas and uh, the society of different countries, and then there's Shias and Sunnis, which really not difference uh, in the religion, but only the uh, Shias take the caliphs. Uh, uh, there were five of them and four of them, uh, like in the in the Christianity. There's John and. Luke or something, all of those names is the same way in there. So this is recognize one thing, we think it's not right. I'm Sunni, and there, other than that, there's no differences. So when you came in here, or you see any Muslims, you don't need, you don't need to ask him what kind of sect of religion you are. You're a Muslim, period that you recognize the oneness of God who carry no children or any association or partnership to his creation. He's the Almighty. And he doesn't have son, daughters or anything like that. Couldn't be human is different. Uh, the definition in, in Islam, uh, God is, is called Noor, light. And we human are from earth. So that cannot be together. And so therefore, no partnership or anything like that to God and God never said that. And Christianity never said that either. It was only the people from uh, Greek and from the Romans, and the Romans forced to say that. Um, when you first came here, how did practicing Ramadan compare to at home? Ramadan? Mm -hmm. The same. 
there is no difference because <coughs> islam doesn't change by time or places you get up in the morning early like 2 3 o'clock in the morning you eat there you eat your your breakfast and then from there on you quit eating drinking or you can even uh, kiss your spouse everything you are all away because this is the time that you are all thinking the god who brought us on this earth and then about 7 o'clock or so when the dark climb up and that's when you start breaking so the ramadan never had any problem here sometimes if you are sick you are supposed to eat but you wake it up some day uh, or you are on a road somewhere uh, god is not cruel it's just make sure that if it's problem for you do it later and make it up other than that, religion doesn't change were you able to um break the fast with others or did you just do it yourself no with others if they are fasting if not i eat my own food and enjoy it <laughs> yeah um were you part of the muslim student association at ball state muslim student association I, i was what now were you part of it no no the reason i didn't <coughs> my uh, i'm a person that i've been through so many these dark areas in life hunger things like that i came in here to enjoy life so whatever you are whatever i am that has nothing to do with it. so no i the first time as i said when when i got married with my uh, wife uh i took my wife to my village and my father was respecting her so much and my father never went to school that she he could not talk i said dad why don't you say hi to uh, elena and talk I said son i don't want to say something that it will injure her feelings that much respect he carried to her so he he was a good muslim and he didn't want to discriminate who you are or who you are not and that's what the world needed to leave me <laughs> that that time uh, islam non islam islam everybody has the same kind of mood came with his mind thanks a lot do you remember anything about um the move of the masjid from the village to ball avenue what was the question uh do you remember anything about the move of the masjid from the village to ball avenue and the 80s well yes uh, uh, we used to go to that that village and then there was these arabs now right now there's saudi arabians also coming uh, to ball state at that time there were no saudi arabians it was iraq kuwait uh some of those small countries they cannot remember their name they were here uh when i we prayed in there and one of these guys finishes master degree or whatever he he give the mask 17000 and <clears throat> he went this uh that the uh, bal avenue that was a church for sale so they bought that so i went in there from there on and then 
people pay a lot of money. All the students came and left the money and went on. So they bought that this mosque now. That we six hundred five six hundred fifty thousand. And it was a I think it was a uh, two business, but the last one was like some kind of bank or as part of the bank or whatever. And so we got that. Um, can you tell me how the community and uh, the mosque has changed over the last few years, uh, few decades? I would say that the beginning there was the mosque and prayer things that they were unknown to human here. And <clears throat> as we came become in more in numbers, everybody was not the same, so they prayed everywhere. So people begin to talk about Islam. Who is it? What is it? And what do you believe? And all of that. But it's getting improved now. And the reason it's getting improved is because Islam makes sense. To, to me it is. So you If you hear somebody about the goodness of God, and then you yourself don't do it, then that's not a good teaching. So Quran is the very self-explanatory, simple. Okay, do it this way, do that way, do this and do that. And then there's nobody in there to tell you what human to tell you, do that, do, do that. And when, when it comes to human, the human always trying to to take their interest first. Maybe politics, maybe money, maybe anything. And the, the worst thing that I'm always as a Muslim worried about is that we, we live only one time on earth. And as we go, to the grave, and that's our grave, whatever comes, that's ours, because that's what we earn. And Quran telling you that you better do a good job and be nice, don't fight, don't steal, just be good to each other so you will have a good life thereafter. Otherwise, the punishment is permanently in the hellfire. Um, you mentioned before a little bit about um, non-Muslims coming to the mosque to learn more. Could you tell me a little bit about any of those experiences? The ones that, whose experience? Uh, just about you teaching others about Islam. I don't teach, but the thing is that I, when I see somebody like this, it reminds me of myself. Because a lot of people, a lot of things I wanted to ask, but I don't have the courage to ask, and I need to know why. So these people came, like this lady this morning, or uh, today's Friday, it's like your Sunday prayer. And she was telling me, I said, you need to, the key to get into, so now I came in here to see how Islam is being practiced. I think she's from history department. She told me that, if I heard her right. And she, I said, okay, come on, I open the door for you. Take your shoes, because you do not go walk with shoes. And sit in that chair and watch us. And she was there uh, for a while, but I had to come. First of all, I couldn't find anybody else to tell me to, to come to you. And so I went on home, and the lady was there. Um, could you tell me a little more about the move to the most recent mosque? 
kind of like what the decision making process was behind that? The most recent, first of all, uh, any Muslims are not for show off. Because anything you do, you do it for your own soul. All right? Whatever the uh, mosque is, and what is it for, or that is exactly what is for one thing that you devote your time, you come in here, pray, and go. In fact, you do not want to stay there longer. Now, that part of, of, of the mosque is not for to show off that this is a mosque, but they got this building only for one reason. It's close to the highway. People coming from, from uh, Indianapolis come there for the business. They're Muslim, they come pray and they go. I've seen a lot of them. But mosque has nothing to do. There is, you, if you wanted to one day, I'll take you there. You come in there to watch, there is on sun, uh, uh, Fridays. And he, there's a talk in there. Never you talk politics. Just to see what God do to us if we don't pray. And that's all. The showing of mosque that has that too big and too kind of a show. Uh, you know, that's, that's not the objective because that's a forbidden uh, in Islam. You have to be really simple, humble to God, simple and pray to, uh, to forgive your soul after you leave. This is the objective of it. So the showing of mass of anything, that has nothing to do with it. I mean, you can pray Anywhere, there's no mosque. So, if it was mosque was important, then you, your prayer would not be accepted here anywhere else. You can pray anywhere. I I pray in my my car. When the time came, I was while I was sitting there, I said, "You don't talk." I just kind of. I, the only thing is, I have to face the qibla. You know what qibla is that uh, the, uh, that's where we face to Qibla and pray. And I've been there. Um, one thing that's unique about the Munti Muslim community is that it's so diverse. There are people from all sorts of countries and converts from, um, from the Munti area. How does this compare to uh, other mosques that you've been to? None. I can assure you that for sure. Now, I've been through many mosques in, in Indianapolis because my son used to live in there. I even in there. I went pray with him. Now, there, you're just a, a person like everybody else come in here, pray and go. There is no any politics. And if they do any time, time politics, there would be a lot of people getting after that man because they are not here for politics. Politics is not real. Um, in 2017, members of the Islamic Center elected Bibi Barami as their first woman president. What do you think about um, the mosque having a woman president? Yeah. <clears throat> when, when I came in here the second time, and that time, Barami himself came in there from Texas. He finished his school and he came in here to qualify to become a teacher, I mean, physician. But he and I had a lot of conflicts. He was one of those Muslims that do exactly like him or he talked to you, against you. Anyway, Bibi was married by him 
after he make many a couple of years after he become a physician. Bibi has not gone to any school in Afghanistan. Uh, his children, her children now, is becoming doctors because Barami pushed them. And Barami made himself the president. Why? Because the mosque needed money. He was a doctor, had the money. There was another doctor, Ansari is his name. He comes from from uh, India. He passed away, God bless his soul, was a nice man. And he was a surgeon. He, he gave a lot of money to the mosque. And Barami did too, he passed away. So Barami now think that he is, the mosque is half of his, his. So he, and he brought about 17, around some numbers of his family here, knowing the fact that you everything you do, you vote. And so they vote for Bibi. But Bibi is a lot more better a woman than Barami is, because Barami doesn't have common sense. He, he has some objective that take advantage of it. If he cannot get it, doesn't part of it, doesn't want any part of it. Um, how would you characterize your own practice of Islam? Humble. Because, first of all, my poverty from the beginning of the life is all there in front of me. When I go to sleep, I thank God for until I go to sleep because I have a bed to sleep. Now, I told you this. When I walk, came back three o'clock home, my father said, go and fish in this river. We don't have ocean. A river, take some fish because we need some food to eat. I went overnight, get my quilt, sleep on the sand, and I had, the way we fish is not like you guys. Uh, here is you have a, one hook and you throw it there, there we have uh, just this size of of uh, of, of uh, thread of hard thread, and then we put them on a big rock in the river. You go up to here until the river. See, we know how far the fish comes out. So then. You put the big rock there, then every two to three meter, you put another small rock, small rock. And in between the two rocks, there's two hooks. So we put them all in there, it's like it becomes from here to the library, that long. Then every hour, you go and put some worms and put in to those, those uh, hooks, and then you watch, you get one or two, three fish every time you watch. Sometimes you don't because these fish, they have their own time. And so my father sent me always there to do that. And when I was sleeping on those sands in the rain, on the other side of the river, there's not anybody around and all night wet and got no fish and came home and my father was very disappointed. So this is how my life started. Now, why should I say now I have, thank God, I have three cars, I have an apartment there I have two homes paid up, and I built this house that you saw. It's all paid up. 
and every time I sleep in there, I pray to God and I thank God for it. Otherwise, why me? Like me, there's millions of people. How come I came to the attention of Dr. Harson, and Dr. Harson brought me here, and I now I own these things. So this part, I thought it is very much godly feelings, because why do I show off to you that look, I have this, I have this, and that. In Afghanistan, there's a lot more showing off. So I don't want to be one of them. Um, you mentioned earlier that you uh, read the Quran often. Could you tell me a little more about how often and like, why you do that? <coughs> I, because of all of these things that happened to me, is due to my God who gave it to me all of these. Because I don't, ha I don't know anything. I came in here, I knew English to teach. But who I teach you English? No. But I came in here, no job. But when I see these things, and I see my life, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, I don't want to make any more money. I don't need it. My son, by God's mercy, he was given, his job was extended to England. They double his salary. So he's making pretty much money. In my own, now I have I have retirement from the banker's life and casualty. I have social security. I have all of these renewals that I wrote to thousand people since 1971 to 1969. No, 1959. That's when I quit. So to me, this is a humble life. I mean, I don't want to be showing up simply because God can take it from me and give it to somebody else. But you have to thank God that through his mercy, he gave it to you. Why you? Why not him or her? So this is what my feelings are always. Um, have you ever given the chutzpah at the Friday prayer? Uh -huh. Have you ever given the speech at the Friday prayer? Yeah, a while did in the in the beginning, and my speech was mostly that's where Barami got mad. I have to, for his satisfaction, hide the truth from Quran because it came into his to negative sentence. For example, okay, you pray. If you don't pray, you go to hell. You know when I said that you didn't like it? So I I had fight with him all the times because he's he is a very strange person to me. I have respect for him. He's a, you know when you are poor. And then when you become rich, you lose yourself. You think you're the top of all of them. You better talk to him nicely or he's going to be mad or rough or something like that. He was my doctor. I fire, fire him. He's not my doctor anymore. Um, you went on the Hajj in 1996. Could you tell me a little bit about your experience? Hajj. Okay, first of all, everybody cannot go Hajj. You have to have money after your family's food and expenses, then you have to Hajj, go Hajj. Because that's that's the fifth the fifth terms of Islam. Uh, there was some I think it was 
Arabic from Saudi Arabia or I cannot remember though. He had, there was about 500 of us from this area, not Masyal or all around area. He collected all of those and I became one of them. So we, he did all of the uh, things has to be done like transportation, uh, ticketing and uh, where we stay and all of that. And also according to Hajj uh, ways that they, they will ask you to pray. So they took us to Medina. Medina is the the where the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is, is the uh, is come from. We prayed in the mosque there one week. Then from there they took us to the mosque, the buses, and went on to Mecca. Now the the place where the the Kaaba is Kaaba is that tall building in there, and there's all around this area, and so Kaaba is sitting there. There's a house of Ibrahim, and <coughs> there is a in that area dry area. There is a a spring water coming right by Kaaba. But when I look at there for about, I was so kind of fascinated that I could not hardly bring myself as a Kaaba. Then the Hajj terms you have to start. You walk. Now you see that river, that little springtime in there? Uh, the Ibrahim had two wives, Sarah and then Hagar. Hagar has a son, Smile was his name. And <coughs> When she came with a baby, she got thirsty in that place. And she running around to find some water and put the baby there on the uh, sand. So he couldn't find water to drink. And now that this is, this all of those what she had done, part of it is a, is a term of completing your hajj. You do the same thing that she did. Now in that place, she she ran for water seven times in that up and down and rocks and things like that. So you have to take your shoes off and run like that. So this little guy, you know, when you put the baby in there, her little feet like that, and that, water came from his feet. And so his mother has to drink water. And then Prophet Muhammad peace him, gave his last speech and he passed away, is there too. So three days you go walk seven times around Kaaba. Then you perform other uh, terms of Hajj, and when you finish, when you are that way, you do not shave, you do not brush your teeth, your bare feet, and you sleep with only white, a long, uh, not pants, what do you call, treasure, is it treasure, they call it treasure, a long one, white, and then, Another one along Rabia. 
That's how people were living at that time. Um, what uh, is the heart of Islam to you? The what? The heart of Islam. Heart? Mm -hmm. Here? I mean, I didn't hear the kick. Um, what is like the central, the core value of Islam to you? Uh, there is no such a thing. You are a you are a human. You are scared of thereafter, for punishment and things like that, and whatever your book says, that you do. Now there is no any other compulsory that if you want to do it, no, you have to do it. You have to do it. If you don't do it, you punish. If you do it, you got the the happiness of God. Um. In today's news media, there's been a lot of um, misunderstanding around the word jihad. What does that term mean to you? Yeah. The, jihad is the word, uh, Arabic word. You mean you, you attempt. If somebody hit you, you get up and protect yourself with your attempt. So the word jihad means that. But then in these political wars, not now, but in the past, and then that word came to this political fighting. Now, <clears throat> if there's a lot of human kind of different thinking. Some wants to fight, some don't want to fight, some want to take advantage, not advantage, but what you call, uh, somebody hits you, you, ha you have to hit him, things like that. So that word used in these political wars. Now, if anybody a non-Muslim, knowing the fact that non-Muslims don't have the same love to the Muslims, so the jihad you were used to give you extra benefit from your God after you die. So. That word jihad came in there. Otherwise, it's the same human that if somebody hits you, you protect yourself. And these are these are the things. But that jihad has no meaning to kill the non-Muslims. Non-Muslims or Muslims. That is between you and the God and in the person you're fighting. So not not the jihad for uh, that you kill people. And believe me, there is no, there is a group in there developing in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, and on. They, they're very, 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 very strict Muslims. I think in Christianity, there are some people like that. And uh, they, they are the ones that have no mercy, no matter what happened. Like I saw in the news, one of the Muslims' women had some kind of, uh, uh, I would say, a married woman to somebody who was not married. And so God caught that he had, uh, what is the word? But I, I have to use a, uh, this word, one word I know, sex. With her. I don't know that that's how you use it. But anyway, they took her, take her to the, uh, uh, court, and the judge said, 
kill her. So they brought her in, this was in the news, brought her in this, uh, this kind of uh, area, all the sand and things like that. They stood her up, and then four or five people with a gun, and when they ordered, kill her right there. Now, these are some of those things The, and I know why uh, it brought this thing to, to do that <clears throat> there is no food to eat. There is disease sexually. It's a lot more and it kill a lot. Islam is completely forbidden. Premarital sex to anybody until they get married. And that lady was married, but had to go to a man who was not married. And they kill her. Did that answer your question? Well, if I went out of your question, stop me. <laughs> Could you talk to me about? Um, how long did it take you to feel a sense of belonging in Munsi? How long did it take what? To feel a sense of belonging in Munsi? Well, <clears throat> I was lucky that I got married, although I was not supposed to be married because my scholarship would not accept driving and getting married here. <clears throat> but after I finished, I got married. Then I think that I'm I'm one one part of the society here, and then my wife and I finished here. We went to Afghanistan. Two years we were there. She was very much respectful to, by all kinds of people in there, and our daughter was born there. And it's funny though, not funny, but look at how God carry on us to different ways. I used to study there in that garden, a nice garden, because I had to go my homework and everything like that. On the other side, I mean, there was a doctor who graduated from France, and he, it was for ladies to have children, and she was born there. So, look, after a long time when I studied with all kinds of miseries, now I have a wife and my child is born here. So, then I feel the same way here. When I came with child, I, I never felt like, I, because I love people, I really do. And so to me, whatever, what the looks, how good or bad, to me, there's the same person I am. So I respect. Um, you already mentioned, uh, but your wife, Elena, is a Christian. Um, so did your children attend the mosque or the church or both? No. Well, when I get married, uh, before we get married, well, this has to be discussed, uh, the religion. I told Elena that I am not in Afghanistan. Everybody knows and everybody is Muslim here. So I'm going to teach these children until they are 18. And then from there on, you teach them. This is how it worked. Now, some decided to become Muslim, some decided to become non-Muslim. But they know Islam. That is not a cruel religion or discrimination or things like that. And Elena taught them all the Christianity. Uh, so, 
and my son is a Muslim, married a Catholic lady from Pennsylvania, a graduate from IU. And they have now four children. Those children carrying Islam, Muslim names, two of them carried my family name. My father is Salih Muhammad. His name is Salih Muhammad. And, but Islam is not going to be, or religion is not going to be standing in front of you from not making progress in life. You're, you're, and your faith, and he and his faith, and that's why we are, we are now almost, we are now completed 49 years we're married. Um, what has been the best part of living in Muncie? What one? What has been the best part of living in Muncie? When I was a student, I was not married. And we had, my job was to have parties in, in the international house. And th those was, that was a new thing to me. I, I remember I saw, I have an apartment there and that lender's loan used to be the secretary of the international house taught me how to dance and as step on her feet and things like that. She, somebody was uh, trying to rent one of those apartments. So I go, here's Linda. Linda, what are you doing here? Well, I have my grandchildren, I, she wants a house in there. But that was the last time I saw her, I didn't, she never show up anymore. So yeah, that was, but on the other hand though, as we grow older, it's not everything is hunky to like we are younger, always. So then you begin to learn the love of little children of your own and your spouse and do things together. That's another really good, good part of life that a lot of us kind of uh, uh, get so mad or bored of life. No matter what is in life, we're the same human. How you look like, where you come from. Any need is different. No, they're all the same human. So if you have children, why you victimize the children? Like I, I married this woman for a long time. I'm going to marry another one. But you know, problem is this, to know a person, man or woman, it's not his, his job. Did you know that whatever my wife is now today, when I was dating her, it was not like that. So many things that your forefathers taught you, this come back to with you when you get older. And then your husband says, Oh, I didn't know that she was like this. And that's where a lot of people don't accept and get divorced unless you are making up with it. Um, have you ever faced discrimination since coming to the, the United States based on your religious identity or your ethnicity? I, in those areas, I, I run very seldom because of the very factors First of all, I respect and I have good time regardless who the person is. Have I known him or not? But I have good time with him. Secondly, if he shows discrimination, my father taught me, and I think I told you that, three things when I was growing up. He said there is, there is one group of people they are nice people. Be actually very nice to them. And say salam means peace every time you go. There are some, some people, they are very much uh, like 
after some kind of benefit, money, respect, or something like that. Those are not the firm human. You say hi to them and get out of there. And then some of them are awfully rotten. Stay away from them as fast as you can. To me, when I talk to people, I see the face and the way they speak to me. I follow my father. And believe me, I never had a lot of discrimination. Uh, in the insurance, I was making more money. Not because I knew, because the older people were interested in me. I speak funny English, where you come from, and all of that. They bought my insurance. And <clears throat> this manager always was kind of rough with me. And one time I, I told him, I said, I forgot his name, Russell, from somewhere in the Middle East, East the West. I said, what's wrong with you? At that time, every 15 days or so, I got check. And those are the renewals and the bonuses that I get. 5,000, 3,000, 2,000. That's besides my commission. And he says, you get all of these monies, you do not have it in your own country like this. So I called the company, I said, what kind of manager you send us here? I work, get the money, you see my checks, he becomes jealous. He was gone. Now, there's another manager still, it's a lady from this town. Uh, Mrs. Clark is his name, her name. One time, I came from uh, my, I went to the office where the secretary is, and gave my check, it was 5,000. But this lady was telling the secretary that she's going to quit. And uh, I really felt sorry for her in my heart because she said I have one little daughter and I go back to become a waitress in the restaurants. I went, what's first, his first name, our first name? Mrs. Clark, Heather, he's still there. And I said, Heather, you're not too long with us. Who knows more English? You or I? And she says, I do. I told her, told her right in front of the secretary. I said, see this check, 5,000. If I make it, what's wrong with you? Exactly what I'm telling you, I told her, and if you want to, take you somebody to our office here, and you talk. And in immediately she said, Judy was our secretary. Judy, if he makes it, why shouldn't I? I'm not quitting. And she came in here to call it quit. Now that, that lady is the manager. <laughs> 90,000 a year she gets. And I'm so happy, simply because I went through so hardship that I hardly find some food to eat. And now if I make it, why shouldn't he? Or he, or she. And she is now the secretary. And she has, one time she told me that she is making 90,000. So my job is always like this. If I make it, why shouldn't you? And the problem with us as a human, especially in this country, 
everything is all done by machine work for you guys. And if you have a hard time, I mean, a, a plan to do physically, you cannot see the strength because the machine is not there, <laughs> mentally and physically. And then you do not need the money. If you, do, you didn't get it from that side, you get it from some other side of that. But to me, they told me the very first time when I became Asian, I flunk out uh, the test three times the intelligent test, let alone the, like, you want to become an usher or a photographer. I don't want to become an usher, I want to be a photographer. And the question was, correct, was usher, because you like people. They wanted to find out your, your feelings toward people. Now that the, then my, Manager, God bless her, him. He gave me sixty dollars. He said, "This is yours. From now on, you don't get anything. You sell insurance. You will get commission. If not, you you are blank." <coughs> and he said, "This is a job. We call him do or die." When I came new to the country, I didn't come to here to die. So I have to do. Now that kind of came, built up so much power into my mind about a discipline. Because you have to have an objective and a discipline to achieve it. Many times I stayed in the hotels. I remember this one guy, Iranian guy, he was an awful driver. So I drove, we went, have you been to Richmond, Indiana? When you go to, uh, toward the south of Richmond, uh, 27, way back in there, uh, two, three, four miles from Richmond, we had a car, and it, we stayed in the hotel in there. In the morning, we get up as early in the morning, and it's not a snow, but ice. So. I took the car, we went there, uh, couldn't find it. Because all of those signs of the, the, the country streets were full with ice. So we get up and do something to one of those. He said, okay, this is it. So we went to this house. The man said, man, you guys be out of your mind. And this morning, Look at this. I said, well, we were there, sir. He bought uh, an accident policy. Our commission was $2.27 for two people. <laughs> so, but we were not uh, unhappy. We sold the policy and we did what we want to, we had to. So these are some of those discipline you have to carry or you are flunk out. Um, I'd like to shift the focus now to um, national and international events that may have affected you. So from 1979 to 1989, there was a Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Um, I understand that you were out of the country by then, but yeah. did that affect your family at all? Yes, it did. My older sister, and my nephews, they all came to Peshawar, Pakistan, which is the borderline. And I went to visit them, by the way, every year. The, some of those friends of mine in the village, they came to see me, because I came from America and they hadn't seen me for a long time. One of them happened to be uh, the charge of the store, uh, f bread store, bread, that the Russians cook, and put there was everybody had come and get one, one bread this long and then go, the soldier of the Russians. 
And he said, I have to dis distribute these, these bread, but I see so many of these, this, the, the uh, officers, and in this hot weather, they have a long coat and come in here, and you're a soldier, and he comes in here, give me your bread. Because he did not have enough. So he took, took his food, that bread, and put it under his coat and walk out. This is the way they were living. And a lot of those soldiers who were hungry, they were eating mulberry. That's why they could not go further than Afghanistan. So the country is very rich. Americans, I think lately, I heard that on the news, there's this $2.6 trillion worth of gold, silver, phosphorus, and all of that in those mountains. But we didn't have the knowledge to take them out. Now they have, they have done that, and then $2.6 trillion worth. And so the Russians could not do it because they did themselves dying of starvation. So life is a very difficult uh, when you are hungry, you don't have shoes, and no protection, but you have to do something. Some survive, some don't. Russian didn't. <laughs> um, moving on, how did the events of 9-11 change your life as a Muslim living in America? <clears throat> I forgot how, what was 9-11 for? Uh, that was the attack on the Twin Towers in New York City. Oh, this guy uh, was a an Arab, and I forgot his name though. I won't remember it though. And he was one of the sect of Islam, and he the Saudi Arabian kicked him out of the country. So we come with all of those Muslims that non-education, they didn't have education. Bring them together, telling them that this, this is not Islamic. People are someday would do away with Islam, going in the mountains and things like that. And those people were of, of his men. This, this, the policy of Islam, not Islam, Islamic country with America was not good, simply because the Israelis and the Middle East and all the Muslims in there, and then they, they always fight in America, doesn't want that to happen. So those 9-11 come up to existence. And this man was teaching them that if you do that, you go directly to the heaven. And those were poor people, didn't have money, didn't have cars or anything like that. So they went in there, either killed themselves or other people so that they can go to, to the heaven. That's the 9-11 develop. Otherwise, it has no meaning that 9-11 was kind of proving to them that these are non-Muslims trying to do away with Muslims. That was the objective in the Islamic countries. But that was not the objective in Islamic countries here. They want to protect uh, Israelis from the Muslims there. Um, did the events of 9-11 impact you or the Muncie Muslim community at all? No. 
<laughs> Muslims don't get together all the times because actually we don't need everybody. If as a Muslim, you know all your religion, you pray when the time to come to pray, other than you just have good time with your own family. And we don't get these. I don't. And in fact, today or tomorrow or sometimes, there is a New Year's picnic. All the Afghans in, in uh, Indianapolis. <clears throat> I was invited, never went an hour and a half ago. Because the thing is, I come in here to learn from different people, not to go and repeat the same kind of language that my, I learned in my village. Um, uh, recently, there has been a lot of Islamophobia in politics and in the news. Have you experienced any of that personally since the election of Donald Trump in 2016? Uh, <laughs> I have a problem with Dr. Mr. Trump, but uh, first of all, the way he talked too much, he was prejudiced. Now, America was not built on prejudice, but look all kinds of people coming from every part of the world. They're looking different, speaking different, and a culture different, and they live like a family. But Trump was kind of trying to separate those. No, that, uh, I don't think that Islamophobia is a word. No Islamophobia here. These words are politics words, to make a big deal out of it. I'll be honest with you, if you are a Muslim, this is your problem. If you are not Muslim, this is your problem, I'm me and my wife. Why should I say that? Because I don't like you because you are a Muslim. Well, we are married 49 years, 10 grandchildren. But the thing is, this Islamophobia word, I never heard it before. And I think it's a very, very artificial kind of word out of somebody's anger. Islam doesn't have anything to do with politics. It's a religion for your own soul. If you want to do it, fine. If not, you're responsible. Believe me, I really t tell you the truth. When you came to pick me up, came from the mosque, I pray. And if I say something, God hearing me, that is not true. I'll be punished. But I'm not telling you the truth. I mean, telling you wrong. It's, everything is true. Islam doesn't have anything with politics. It's your soul and your life thereafter. And so in the Quran, I read them all the times. What are your hopes for the future? Huh? What are your hopes for the future? Just to live, peace, uh, live peacefully and die peacefully. And with the respect for my family. It, 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 if they respect me or not, doesn't matter. I have done anything wrong with them. Here's my objective was when I came to this country. With all of these hunger, kind of way of life, as I was young, it passed through. People were eating food, and I was looking at their food that they were chewing and said, you know, it must be some good taste in there. Unfortunately, I don't have it. And my mouth watered because I was hungry too. So when I came in here, the opportunity was unlimited. So when I have children, I said, there's one thing is not going to happen. While I'm living on a certain, my children are not going to live like I did. So this insurance really got me. Now today, if I die, I have some money for each one of them. And I want them to live until they grow like I did, 
and they go and do their best. So I'm, I, that's all. I I just want to make sure that my <laughs> being an insurance man, you write insurance, you you know who is the beneficiary. My wife beneficiary too, the first one. So after I lived longer, I told her one night. I said, Elena, listen. In this country, my neighbor was one of them. He was from Iraq, and his wife was from Czechoslovakia. And as soon as he died, she took all working in the body making of uh, of. Uh, Chevrolet, way back in Marion, you heard him probably or not. And he had <clears throat> a lot of insurance. She took all of them. So the next month, month or so, he's a guy coming in with a truck full of his stuff. Yeah, I'm getting married now with her. So he, they got married, and they were there six months. He told her that he was professor, but he wasn't. He was a photographer on Ball Street. And they, we couldn't see anymore the wife of the man who died. They went to those big, big hotels in New York City, other places. So, and then everything she did that, she told my wife. And after a while, she started crying to my wife. All of those monies I collected from, he got it. We spent it. No, I don't have any. So six months after, the same truck came in there, packed him up and went on. So knowing these things, I didn't want my wife <laughs> to be doing like this. So I told her, took her name as the first and added up as my children. And her father died so much money and I don't know how much, but I, was, I said, I'm not worried about it, and I don't need it, because I'm making my own money. So I want to fear the mother and the father, the, no matter what happening, these are reality. You don't split them simply because of the money. So I made her, uh, a beneficiary equally to my children. She cannot get mine, my money and go get married. <laughs> and my children won't be bad in there. Um, in closing, and you can take a few moments to reflect on this, do you have one story from your life that captures what it means to you to be a Muslim in America? Say that one. Uh, do you have one story from your life that captures what it means to be a Muslim in America? Well, first of all, I was born and raised in a Muslim family. For a while, I didn't practice. My, my father was, was a stick after me to get up and pray. Now, also, I saw many people, some was born, some died. And then when they die, if he's not a good person, he didn't pray, didn't make, uh, didn't earn anything. So we'll be in the hell fire forever. I was scared of that. So I continue simply because as, as I grow older, I look around. 
the sun goes from one end of the world to the other. Then the moon comes in the night. That's the way it is. Any machine can do it now. Any knowledge, no. My mind couldn't accept it. So it's got to be God. And that God is the one, got to be one, because otherwise it would be a double of there will be a war. So that brought me to the fact that God is real, death is real, and punishment, the hereafter is real. And so I have to, I have to follow. And when I follow, I become happy because I did my job. Did I answer that question? Well, thank you, Fez. On behalf of the Virginia View Ball Center Seminar, Muslims in Muncie, I want to thank you for sharing your story with us today. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for giving me the chance because that's what we are here, all of us as a human on earth, to recognize, to know each other. Irregardless of what we do, that's our problem. But to know, because I hate to see that I die ignorant. And that's very difficult. And I, I will not have a chance to come back and start again. Okay. Anything I could do for you guys, I love education. And I taught all of my, uh, a quarter of my life probably, in Kabul University. And whatever I learned, I appreciated America, taught me to become an able student, a teacher to teach, and then brought me here. Those Americans that came to my country and taught me, those were not really a kind of wishy-washy. They had to, you had to follow what they say to you. So these are all understanding of the world and that way I'm sitting today with you guys. Otherwise, I, I feel like, uh, who are you to sit in here with this group of people? And simply because those are the ones I learned. And if you learn, do for your own good. And apparently I have done a good job today. And so I walk in bare feet, I have a car. <laughs> I hope I didn't get you guys bored. <laughs>